Hey, Cody Firearms Museum Facebook followers. You're super lucky to this week because you got one ambush Facebook Live from California, and now we're back here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And what day is it today, Danny? It's International Women's Day, Ashley. <laughs> Thank you. <You're> welcome. <laughs> so we decided to take this opportunity to talk about some important women in firearms history. And if you don't know about your Wyoming history, we are the Equality State. And that was because we were the first territory to give women the right to vote in 1869. And so we are standing here in front of probably the most iconic woman in firearms history. Who is it, Dan? Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley. Annie Oakley was born Phoebe Ann Moses, and she was born in Dark County, Ohio. And she has a really interesting story because she was, you know, legendary for her performances with Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but she actually got started subsistence hunting to support her family, and she helped pay off her family's mortgage uh, when she was just a kid. And then when she was 15 years old, her life changed forever. And that was because a marksman, a famous marksman named Frank Butler, came into a town right near where she lived, and he challenged any local to come and compete against him. So a teenage Annie Oakley decided she would go and try her luck at that, and she not only held her own, she beat him. And that kind of started the story of Frank and Annie, and they ended up getting married, um, they performed together, he was served as kind of her manager in some respects, and they, they were married for their entire lives, worked together for their entire lives, so it's a really kind of nice love story, if you will. But Annie Oakley was an amazing exhibition shooter, and I, I didn't look up the quote this morning, but one of my favorite quotes about Annie Oakley uh, talks about how, you know, if a man does it, you know, it's exhibition shoot shooting, if I do it, it's a trick. Um, we've got some guns here if you want to come down and look at them. Uh, we've got many of the guns in the museum that belong to Annie Oakley. We've got some that are on display here in the Buffalo Bill Museum. And then we also have one over in the Cody Firearms Museum. My personal favorite, though, in this one is the Smith & Wesson number 3. Uh, it's actually going to be featured in our book that's coming out this year. And we know from records that she purchased three Smith & Wesson number 3s in her lifetime, and we know that this is one of them. But she was known to shoot uh, Winchester rifles. A lot of those rifles were smooth bore. I knew talk, that was coming. talk a little bit about Smoothbore, Danny. Well, the last time we posted something on Smoothbore, we got a couple questions that 1892s were only made as rifles, but both Annie Oakley and Buffalo Bill shot lever action rifles that, from the factory, had smooth smooth bores, and the factory called them smooth bore rifles, and both Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley referred to them that way, and so we have a couple. So if you see us referencing an 1892 or an 1873 smoothbore, they do exist, but. That's, that's the story on our smooth boards. Our camera lady was nodding because she runs the records. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, we're going to start walking out of this museum and we'll talk a little bit more about Buffalo Bill's Wild West, but then also some of the other women that were involved in the, in the show. Scare quotes because Buffalo Bill didn't like that. But something a lot of people don't know about Buffalo Bill was that he was incredibly impressive for his time. And if you want to just pan around to this case, uh, it says William F. Cody and women's rights. And he was um, a big supporter of the women's right to vote. Um, he was very supportive of women in his show. Uh, he had many women that were involved in it, and they were very strong players. Um, and one of them was the highest paid performer in Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Uh, her name's not often known. Her name was Nan Tugun Aspinwall. And we have one of her guns that'll be featured in the book this year. Uh, it's a Remington Model 24. And uh, we've got Nan's guns. And then we also, in our, our archive, have several firearms, or not firearms, several photographs. We don't have a firearm yet that belong to Lillian Smith. Now, with Annie Oakley, you've got um, this kind of demure, conservative, uh, woman and with Lillian Smith you had the exact opposite. Uh, Lillian Smith was, um, she was called the California Girl. She too started as a teen but she started performing rather than just subsistence hunting and she got picked up by Buffalo Bill's Wild West and uh, she and Annie Oakley did not get along too well. We have to apologize it's kind of a loud museum so you're going to hear like all kinds of nonsense as we walk through. You may notice that we're now open to the public soon. Yes we are open to the public. There are people enjoying this live in person and people who are probably not enjoying it live <laughs> on the That's camera. Weird. But Lillian Smith and Annie Oakley were um, arch rivals, if you will, uh, and Lillian Smith ended up leaving Buffalo Bill's Wild West, um, but before that, Annie Oakley kind of was fed up, walked away from the, the, the show, and then came back um, after Lillian Smith had left, but she too went on to set several world records throughout her entire life. Um, often a less talked about person because she was kind of the uh, brash, 
swearing uh, cool girl, if you will, that fell out of favor with the press after a poor showing at Wimbledon and England. The, the whole team went out to uh, England and they were doing a, a, a performance, a series of exhibition shooting, and she shot terribly that day and the press like just slaughtered her. And we're uh, walking up now to our ghost Buffalo Bill, which you probably won't be able to see on here, but we have a hologram. hologram which is pretty neat, of uh, Buffalo Bill talking. I put a lot of walking American into today's. In front. Can you see it? Can you see it? The American West is a priceless possession. If you're following me through some of these. Look, look, it's Bruce Sowers, our director of revenue. He's super happy about being on camera. <laughs> <laughs> this year, um, we're very excited that it's our centennial year. I know I've talked about it in previous, um, in previous posts, but it is 100 years since Buffalo Bill passed away, but it's also 100 years since we founded the Buffalo Bill Center of the West. And the Buffalo Bill Center of the West was founded by Buffalo Bill's niece, Mary Chester Allen, who after he had passed away, she decided that she wanted to find a way to commemorate his life. And so in 1917, uh, they founded the Buffalo Bill Memorial Association. And uh, after right around that period, Mary Dister Allen contracted the sculptress Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney to make a sculpture of Buffalo Bill called the Scout, which is still on site right here. Now, Whitney, though, didn't like where the original configuration of the building was. She bought 40 acres of property, and that is where we're standing right now. And so you'll, you'll notice that, look, women came up again. <laughs> Uh, women helped to found this organization, but the one thing that I like to point out, I'm getting winded as we walk because it's so far. <laughs> it is really far. <laughs> we did not plan out how far that is. having a big property. Yes, we're actually, uh, the building itself is 70 acres. Now, before we get to our next firearm, is that while today is International Women's Day and we're taking this opportunity to talk about a lot of really important women in firearms history, it's important to note that women have been integral to all of firearms history and here at the Buffalo Bill Center of the West and specifically the Cody Firearms Museum we feel strongly that we can bring out those storylines when they're relevant we can do a better job at telling those stories but because they've always been a part of firearms history we want to show that they're integral to it and not separate from it um, and it's one of those really neat things that you think about like in, in early history we'll show you a couple of uh, royalty pieces that were uh, that belong to women but they've also been involved in managing companies They've been involved since the late 19th century. They've been involved in gunsmithing. They've been involved in engraving. They've really, I can't say it more. They've always been involved and they've always been a crucial part to our history. And, and gun companies realized this and in the late 19th century. They marketed specifically to women because they recognized that female exhibition shooters, female hunters, uh, homesteaders going out west, that they were a very important customer to them. And so you can look at all of the late 19th century advertising and you'll get some weird wonky things that are definitely culturally linked to the time period. But you can see that they're trying to reach out because they recognize this concept of women and guns is not new. Yeah, and a lot of people think that the marketing for women and firearms is a new thing that's just only recently emerged, but it's been going on for many, many years, for well over a century. Oh my gosh, yeah. And you know, everyone always talks about right now, in the past couple of years, women are the largest growing group of firearms owners in, in the country. And while that's true, as, as Dan just said, it is really important to acknowledge that they, and, and women are certainly uh, taking up a, a large portion of that consumer base. Uh, the gun right down here belonged to one of my favorite ladies, uh, Blinky Topperwine. Her name is Elizabeth Servati Topperwine. And she was a part of the exhibition shooting duo, the fabulous Topper Wines, Ad and Plinky Topper Wine. Um, Adolf Topper Wine, Ad Topper Wine, was an exhibition shooting shooter for Winchester. And he met Plinky at a, at a ma manufacturing facility uh, back on the East Coast. She had never fired a gun before. They got married really fast. Um, but there's another one of those couples that was just a really you know, successful, long marriage love story, if you will, uh, because that's a good one. Shooting and really, that, nope, I'm stopping. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't hear that. We're, we're moving on. Uh, and, we're live. <laughs> and I haven't had coffee yet. 
Um, so uh, Blinky learned to shoot, Anne taught her to shoot, and they would shoot together during their shows, but um, a lot of the things that she would do, including with this Winchester Model 1890 with Bird's Eye Maple Stock um, in 22, is that Ad would hold uh, matches out um, and she would shoot them in between his fingers and then he would light a cigarette and she would shoot out the burning ember. And we have... Don't try this at home. Yeah, don't try that at home. We, we, everyone always, when I'm giving a tour, goes, and that's a real good sign of marital trust. <laughs> uh, and uh, we have the video of them performing together down in our, in our research library. I'd love to get that live for people to see because it really is fascinating because one of the one of the feats that they did, Ad stands on his head and Blinky holds his feet and he fires uh, a shotgun. It's, it's crazy what they were able to accomplish. And she actually went on to set more world records than he did. Yeah, um, and, so yes, and there was a big debate as to whether or not she was better than Annie Oakley. And I, I read in a newspaper article that she did meet Annie Oakley once before Annie Oakley passed away. It's a bold accusation to make. Yeah, it's, it's pretty ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> we have several of Plinky's guns here in the museum. Unfortunately, we don't have any of ads, but I know that the NRA museum has a lot of ads guns, and so I always... What's up, NRA? I know, hey guys. Um, I always I joke with them that I would love to see the his guns and her guns reunited for like a rotating exhibition or a traveling exhibition someday. We're going to come over into this corner and highlight another really amazing woman who uh, lives up in Montana. I'm sure many of you guys uh, are familiar with Bob Munden, the fastest man with a gun who ever lived, uh, set several Guinness Book of World Records, um, held several world records in general, uh, was known for quick draw, just an amazing talent. Um, and we all, we've talked about him a lot, but I want to, for today, to talk a little bit about Becky because she was equally as skilled and she also set several world records, but my favorite story is that uh, her, the first time she went to compete, because her brother was involved in it, but the first time she went to compete, she competed against Bob Munden. She got the draw against Bob Munden and when Becky tells the story, it's that she, he was able to, you know, pull his gun, fire, and holster it, and then walk back before she could ever get the shot off, so it looked like she was shooting him in the back. <laughs> but they, uh, they fell in love, they got married, um, and Becky has some gorgeous firearms here. Um, I love the rose detailing on the grips of her Colts, as well as the matching ones on her boots and shirt. And Becky was very instrumental, Becky and her, and her daughters were very instrumental in getting this exhibition out and on display here a few years ago, so we're very grateful that she um, allowed us to do that, and it allows us a chance to interpret more modern history, Absolutely. which we don't always do in the, in the museum, but we're trying to be better at it. And it tells a lot about the uh, fast draw history, the history of cowboy action shooting, and really the fact that it's, again, not a gender specific type of industry. You know, I always say shooting is such a great equalizer. Thanks, Sam Colt. Um, because, uh, you know, women and men alike, you know, are just able to accomplish amazing uh, things. I'm not able to do that. Let's be very clear about that. I'm highly adequate. I, just, I was just shaking my head, and it was because I can't either, not because she's a bad shot. <laughs> <laughs> I was not agreeing He's with that. He's saving his job there. Um, we're going into our fire manufacturing um, wing, um, and we're going to stop at a couple more places. But um, I mentioned that uh, in the late 19th century that there was a lot of marketing to women and we'll see some of the advertisements uh, of women as we walk through. But we, I wanted to point out right here is a uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, George Custer gun. It's Remington Rolling Block. It's a sporting arm, not a military arm. Our only Custer guns are sporting arms, uh, ironically. Um, but all of the Custer guns we got were given to Winchester by um, his widow, Elizabeth Custer. So they came from her estate after he had passed away. So we're going to walk around the corner right in here, and I'll show you another Annie Oakley gun that we have. Uh, but I want to I, I want to point out something that's kind of silly in like the early design of the museum, which is that we have a really pretty picture of Annie Oakley over here. You see it? It's beautiful. That's not where her gun is. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a highlight on one of our educational tours. Uh, this is our Ithaca. The only thing about this gun is that the um, stock was uh, changed by a later owner, but the rest of the gun is uh, original to how she had it. Um, and it would have belonged to her later in her lifetime before she passed away. Um, so this is not a Buffalo Bills Wild West piece. This is a, a later in life gun, which is kind of neat. I always find that really interesting because we've got so many guns that are tied to the arena performances, um, to the quote-unquote trick shooting, but to see something that actually belonged to them personally and something that they used for their own use, whether hunting or just fun target shooting, is kind of a neat little thing. I bet our viewers did not expect pro tips on how to build a museum this morning either. <laughs> 
No, no. Well, I guess <laughs> that, that one's free. With us, those are some free tips. If you're gonna have a gun that belongs to somebody, don't put the picture around the corner because it's confusing to even me. Uh, true story, when I first started here, um, someone was like, there's an Annie Oakley gun in the museum. And I was like, cool, okay, I, I, yes, I know where it is. And I had just started and um, I walked right to that picture and I was trying to read the labels and I was like, yeah, it's not here. I don't know where it is. And so I'm like, so I'm trying to figure that out. Despite what people think, we don't always know where every single gun is. Yes. It's this um, gun right here, this is a one-of-a-kind Sharps air rifle that Christian Sharps made for his daughter, Satella, or Nutella, <laughs> as I accidentally called her earlier today. Uh, it's uh, silver, and uh, the one problem with it was it was really um, a little bit too big for her. It was for her 10th birthday, um, so it didn't get a lot of use, but he never made another air rifle. So a little bit of uh, Curiosa history from uh, Christian Sharps, a major gun designer and uh, manufacturer and famous with a Sharps rifle. I don't know why you're backing up, Jesse. Is there a monster behind me? What are you doing? <laughs> uh, we'll stop in here for a second. I mentioned that in the late 18th century, um, the firearms companies embraced uh, the fact that there were uh, females that were buying guns and, and using guns. And, um, and so they, Smith & Wesson came out with a line that is pretty iconic. I think everybody's heard of the Lady Smith. Um, and you can see that we've got um, a Lady Smith right there. 22 caliber, and this was uh, made around the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. And then an interesting part of history is that you go throughout the 20th century, and then in the 1980s, I think 1989, if I'm correct, um, Smith and Wesson re-released the Lady Smith. Um, the only major difference is they added a capital S there, um, and then they came in different calibers. And there's semi-auto versions, and there's revolver versions, um, and then there was uh, another one that came out because the gun was so popular amongst all shooters, including men, that they came out with another um, gun that was pretty identical to the Lady Smith. And I, I didn't look it up before, but I want to say it's like the NL, and um, it means new line, but it, everyone joked that it meant not Lady Smith, <laughs> <laughs> so that the people wouldn't get made fun of uh, in the uh, locker room. I'm sure someone will comment with the correct. I'm meaning. sure. Um, it's actually, uh, the first place I read that was Jim Sapika's book on Smith & Wesson. So, like we said, we've got a couple of advertisements. I'll let Jesse kind of zoom in on this one because it's one of the ones you see most often. Um, this one's not in English, but uh, Winchester used women in their advertising, um, also a lines of marketing for them. Um, it really just kind of depended on whatever they were selling at the time. But uh, there's also a series of advertisements we have on the um, on the online collection that features female exhibition shooters trying to get women to get excited by it because if these if this woman can do it you can do it and you should buy the same gun as her and so it's kind of a neat little uh, marketing ploy. And while we don't think of exhibition shooters as super popular today as there's still some around but they're not quite the superstars that they were of the day but the female exhibition shooters back at the turn of the century around it, Annie Oakley and Flicky Topper Wine these were very large pop culture stars for their for their time. Oh my gosh, yeah. And we have to, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our girl Kirsten Joy Weiss though, because there are some women and some men who are really kind of continuing that legacy of exhibition shooting. And if you haven't seen her stuff, you should look her up on YouTube because she's recreated a lot of Annie Oakley shots, but then she does a whole series of other things with historic guns, modern guns, and she's just a really great representative of the firearms industry and the, the really the exhibition shooting brand. The last gun we're going to uh, come to today, before we wrap up, uh, belongs to another very notable lady, and that is Catherine the Great, Empress of Russia. And this is a blunderbuss, a flintlock blunderbuss, that she had made uh, specifically to give to King Louis XV of France. Um, she gave it to King Louis XV of France. We're not 100% sure what the reason was. It was really common for royalty to kind of use um, embellished arms as kind of a sign of peace. Uh, because a lot of them were sport shooters. Catherine the Great was an avid sport shooter. We have a gun online from the Smithsonian that's a Jaeger rifle or one of her hunting rifles. And so uh, it was kind of, it, it's not ironic that you would give a gun as a sign of peace. It was a very common, common thing to do. And um, we know that they were involved in a truce uh, around this time period when this would have been made. So we can speculate that that would have been the reason that they would have. Uh, exchange this firearm, but we're not 100% sure. Um, there is a, uh, actually a bust of uh, King uh, Louis, uh, King Henry, <laughs> wrong King, King Louis, uh, King Louis' face um, at the top, and there's several other uh, French seals and symbols on the gun, but it was made at the, in Tula, Russia. 
So this is another one of the firearms that we have in our museum. But I said close to the beginning that we acknowledge that women have been integral to the entirety of firearms history. And so as you'll notice when you walk through, we don't separate everything out and put it in a corner. We like integrating it and telling those stories when they're relevant. And we're going to try to in the new museum continue to do that because women have been, you know, on the battlefield, especially in the 20th century, but they dressed as men on the battlefield, you know, back in the revolution. And they've always played this role. And so we're really kind of grateful that there's a lot of new and renewed energy around women and shooting because it is something that's certainly uh, relevant, interesting, and important uh, to us uh, owning guns today. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that women have been doing this for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and that they are always a part of the history and we hope that they'll be a part of the future. You like Ooh. how I wrapped that up? That, you was, like that? that was nice. That was Put a little bow on it. Yeah, that was great. Uh, well, we hope you guys enjoyed this. I know we did a lot of walking and we kind of covered a lot of ground. I'm a little windy, and I'm not going <laughs> to lie. Um, but we hope you enjoyed this for International Women's Day. If you have any questions, you know where you can leave your comments. And uh, we'll try this again next week. I don't know what we're going to cover, but. Something cool. Something, Thanks for watching. Something cool. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye.